Hello and welcome back to The Savvy Psychologist. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and every week I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. So today, we are lucky to have with us Maria Konnikova, psychologist and author of not one, but two New York Times bestsellers. The first was the tantalizingly titled Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. And her most recent, The Confidence Game, Why We Fall for It Every Time, was awarded the 2016 Robert P. Bales Prize in Critical Thinking. She's a contributing writer for The New Yorker, and her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Slate, Salon, Scientific American, Wired, and numerous other publications. So Maria Konnikova, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So I am excited to talk to you about the psychology of the con. And I will admit that I didn't know that the term con, as in con artist, con man, getting conned, is short for confidence, as in, do you have confidence in me? Do you trust me? Because that's what the con is based on, trust. And we all think we're con-proof. None of us think we would ever be so gullible as to fall for a con. But you say that's exactly what makes us so vulnerable. So what about us? What about each of us makes us a good mark? Well, I think that, um, so to back up a little bit, because a lot of people have taken issue over time with the fact that I say that everyone is vulnerable. They say, well, I'm not vulnerable or, you know, I'd never fall for that. And I'm not saying that every single person is vulnerable to every single con, saying there's a con out there for everyone. And I think the reason that that's true is because, you know, we all have things we want to believe in. We all have kind of our own versions of reality that we live in. And just to be clear, my version of reality is not the same as your version of reality. So we, we all have kind of slightly different viewpoints and interpret events in different ways. And neither one is objective reality. Um, you know, there's the famous uh, experiment where people observe a car accident and you get, you know, 12 different descriptions based on the 12 different people. And it sounds like 12 different events. And I think that that's kind of indicative of who we are. So what con artists are really, really good at doing is figuring out what version of the world do you believe in? And how do I craft a story that will fit in with that reality? And that's tapping into your individual psychology, your individual kind of hopes, dreams, fears, insecurities. Um, and that makes you vulnerable. And the reason I say that thinking yourself vulnerable actually makes you more vulnerable is that overconfidence can be a really um, big problem because if you think that you are not going to be likely to fall for a con, um, then you might get into all sorts of trouble. Um, and con artists love that. There's a quote that I use in my book from David Moore, who was a linguist who in 1940 wrote this brilliant book, The Big Con. And he, he writes that the New Yorker is the best sucker um, in the world because he fancies himself so wise. He's just, he's just ready to be taken. Um, and I love that. I think that really captures it. The wiser you think you are, the better mark you are because you're just not going to see it coming. Because who me? I'd never fall for a con. Right. So, so okay. So that's the victim, the, the mark. So of course, now we have to talk about what makes a good con artist. So I'll ask you to take us through this now. What is the dark triad and how does it manifest in a con artist? Um, so the dark triad um, is three traits that don't necessarily have to go together, but often do go together. And that's um, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. And so the first one, psychopathy, is I think the one that most people are familiar with. Um, and really, it's basically the fact that a psychopath does not experience emotion in the way that a non-psychopathic brain does. So your brain actually is physically different. So this is one of the few traits that actually has a neuroanatomical signature. So you can look at brain scans and you can figure out which ones are psychopaths and which ones aren't. Now, this doesn't mean you're a serial killer. It doesn't mean you're a horrible human being. It just means that you're not experiencing emotions the same way that someone who's not a psychopath is. So you don't have that hot, visceral response. Instead, it's all cognitive, logical, um, because your brain is simply wired up differently. The reason why a lot of con artists have those sorts of psychopathic tendencies is because con artists really have to be ruthless. You can't feel any sympathy for your victims. Once you do, you know, you're, you're no longer a very good con artist. Uh, one of my favorite stories that I came across involved this guy um, 
there's a very, very uh, common con called the IRS scam. And so someone calls you on the phone and says, you know, you owe $2,000, $4,000, whatever it is to the IRS and back taxes. If you don't pay, you're going to go to jail. And this works really well because people are really anxious. They're scared of the IRS. They think, oh, maybe I did make a mistake because taxes are scary and complicated. Anyway, this works. A lot of people fall for it. So this guy calls a woman um, and says, you know, I have this bad news for you. You owe $2,000 or whatever it was. And she starts crying. She says, oh my God, you know, I'm nine months pregnant. We own a store. How am I going to pay my bills? And she just loses it. She has like a fit on the phone and he's listening. And finally he says, lady, it's a scam. And he <laughs> hangs up the phone. So that's not a good con artist. Psychopathy would take, take care of that problem. So the second, the second trait is narcissism. And that isn't just an overinflated sense of self. Um, that's also the sense of entitlement that you deserve what the world has coming. And so this allows con artists to really get away with a lot of things with no, no conscience, really not feeling guilty about it. Um, so they say, you know, I deserve that more than you. It should rightly be mine anyway. So I'm just going to go ahead and take it because really I'm just writing the universe. This is the way the world should be. So I don't mind, you know, depriving you of whatever it is you know, money, trust, whatever, PhD credentials, a lot of conners love stealing those, whatever it is, you know, I'm just taking it because I deserve it. And then I think the most important part for a con artist of the triad um, is Machiavellianism, which comes from Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, and this is the ability to persuade someone to do what you want them to do without their realizing that you're doing it. And so you think it's coming from you. You actually think it's your brilliant idea that you really want to do this. Well, and really, it's what the con artist wants. Um, and this kind of insidious persuasion is really crucial in getting the con artist to actually accomplish his end. I think you can be a con artist and not be psychopathic. But you can't be a con artist and not be Machiavellian. Yes. So it it's funny that you mentioned the IRS scam because I actually got that call as a robocall on my phone the other day. And I luckily I had heard of it before. So I knew it was a con. But even so, it caused this very visceral reaction in me. And I can see how that con is so successful because it creates this real emotion. And I can see how that would be hard to think through. Okay, so back to our interview. So Maria, as I was reading your book, I was impressed in the sense that the tools of a con artist are surprisingly low tech. So for me, like when I think of someone who like puts on a persona, I think of spies or double agents with like a camera pen or an unshredder. But even in the digital age, a con relies on a narrative, a well-told story. So tell us about the importance of stories and other low-tech elements of a successful con. Yeah, um, so I actually think that storytelling is the single crucial element of the con. I mean, the best con artists are the best storytellers in the world. And if they have that, and then the will to con, that's basically, that's not all you need, but that is the, that's the linchpin yeah, on, on which everything else hangs. And if you don't have it, and yet you have everything else, you're screwed. You can't be a good con artist if you're not a good storyteller. Um, and I think this goes back to kind of the fundamental way that we've evolved, which is that kind of human brains, human minds really hate uncertainty. They hate ambiguity. They want kind of resolution and they want cause and effect. So it's really, it's, the world is a really scary place. And so we, we need to make sense of it. You know, imagine like thousands of years ago when, you know, there's no science, like you have no idea what's going on. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's all this scary stuff going on. Um, and so you want explanations, you know, think about the privileged role in a society that the person who can make sense of it, who can tell the story, has always received. I mean, those are always the highest people in society because they help quell that fear. They help you figure out, you know, cause and effect, why this is happening. They have an explanation. They make the world manageable. Um, and they also help, you know, with traditions, memories, etc. So storytelling just has a very powerful role and it fills a very fundamental need in every human being. I do think that this is something that is just fundamental to being human. And so what story, uh, what con artists do is they hijack this because 
you know, stories can be used for good and often are. And I think stories are just incredibly powerful. But con artists hijack them for their own ends and they tell stories that are false. And yet, because storytelling is so powerful, we're swept in because a few things happen. So there are some really interesting studies that show that when we're swept up in a story, we stop seeing logical inconsistencies the way we would if you just present us with facts or kind of um, show us the story in a different light. So the moment that it's a narrative form, our brain actually is much more willing to accept a lot of different things and not see red flags. Um, and stories are emotional. They get us emotionally involved. Emotion and logic are kind of at, not at opposite ends of the spectrum, but they, they don't get along that well. And it's much more difficult to be logical when you're emotional. They make you involved. So you're an actor. They make you empathetic. So you're, I mean, they just do all of these things that draw you in. You become an actor in this narrative. And so the best con artists are incredibly powerful storytellers. And that's why you can't get away. That's why you don't even see it's a con because you don't realize you're supposed to be questioning it. You're just swept up in a really powerful tale. Yeah, you're part of it. Yeah. So, so the very things that make us human and give our lives purpose, like belief, meaning, hope. So these are the same things that make us vulnerable to cons. So, you know, not wanting to give those things up. What, if anything, can we do to resist? Can we con-proof ourselves? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and initially, my answer was, you know, lock yourself in your apartment, throw away the key. People suck. Don't trust anyone. Um, I've gotten over that, but I still am much more, I think, pessimistic than most um, just because I spent so much time with con artists. But I think there are some things that we can do. The first is something just very basic, which is make yourself less of a target. Um, so, you know, don't share as much on social media. Never accept friend requests from people unless you've met them in real life. Never check into places. You know, don't tell people where what you like, you know, where you're drinking, what you're eating, who your friends are, whether you're getting married, how you, you know, how you're feeling today. Are you feeling down or are you feeling hashtag blessed? You know, all of those things are things that are just mana from heaven to the con artist because you're creating a profile. You're also showing when you're vulnerable because people who are emotionally vulnerable are really good targets. So make it minimize your target ability by kind of taking those sorts of steps. And then there are other things that we can kind of habits of mind that we can get into. Um, the most powerful, I think, is also very, very difficult to implement. And it is learning to see yourself in the third person. So if it seems too good to be true, it is. There are no exceptions. You're not the exception. However, this is impossible to implement in reality to, when it comes to yourself, because things can be too good for someone else, but not too good for you. Like, this is pretty great. Oh, my God. Like, I deserve this. This is awesome. You know, I found my true love or I made a great investment decision. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So it's not too good for you. It's actually exactly what you had coming. Um, so if you learn to think of yourself in the third person, so I call it like your next door neighbor, Bob test. So imagine this happened to Bob. What would you tell Bob? Would you be really happy for Bob? Um, or would you tell Bob, hey, there are a few red flags. Maybe you want to investigate this a little further. Easier said than done, because you're always going to figure out ways why you're different from Bob and why what happened to Bob doesn't apply to you. Our brains are brilliant at rationalizing when we want to, especially when we want to believe something good. But at least it's a start. Um, and if you take it seriously, it might be helpful. And the final thing I, I would say, um, and this isn't especially true of Americans, because we really like people to like us. Um, we don't want to come across as rude. Learn to say no. So have scripts in your head for how to get out of situations and what your limits are and things that you won't cross. Because oftentimes we end up in social interactions and we don't know how to exit them because we don't have kind of scripts for that. So we end up in a con not because we're being necessarily stupid, but simply because we don't know how to say no and how to st step back. So those are my tips. So my last question may be related or it may be completely unrelated. So you are in the middle of spending a year playing professional poker all around the world and at the World Series in Las Vegas. So are there any parallels? Does did the house or your opponents, like with their literal poker faces, use any elements of the con? Or is poker a different animal? No, absolutely. Absolutely. My background um, in kind of studying con artists has been incredibly helpful um, because 
poker players um, are also storytellers, right? They're trying to they're trying to get you to believe the story they're telling. Trying to say, you know, I am not bluffing. Just let me win this pot. Just give up. And so you have you start learning to look at the stories and figure out, okay, does the story make sense? Is it a logical story? And you start realizing when they're trying to manipulate you, get you emotionally involved, like get a rise out of you. So it's actually very, very similar, lots of parallels. Um, and I think there's a reason that my books have followed the trajectory they've gone <laughs> and have gone from con artists to poker. Um, so I'm hoping that those tools and kind of the things that I've learned in the con world will help me um, ultimately become a better poker player. Well, that is fascinating. And Maria Konnikova, it is enlightening and a delight to talk to you. So thank you so much for being here today. Maria's best-selling books, The Confidence Game, Why We Fall For It Every Time, as well as Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, are available anywhere books are sold. So, kick, so pick up a copy or both today. I know you will enjoy her writing as much as I did. Thank you so much for listening. As always, thank you so much for making The Savvy Psychologist a part of your life. Never miss an episode when you sign up for the newsletter at quickanddirtytips.com slash newsletters. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. You can listen on Spotify or SoundCloud, like on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at QDT Savvy Psych, or follow me at Ellen Hendrickson. And finally, if you are shy, introverted, or socially anxious, check out ellenhendrickson.com for science-backed goodies and resources you will only find there. That's ellenhendrickson.com. As always, The Savvy Psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and doesn't substitute for mental health care from a licensed professional. Have a wonderful week! I will see you all next Friday for a happier, healthier mind. <laughs>